How's everyone doing today? My name is Yupari and I'd like to welcome you to this week's portrait painting demonstration. This week's video includes another full length demonstration with over an hour and 30 minutes worth of painting time along with detailed explanations on my thought process. So sit back, relax, and allow me to guide you through this painting from the very first brush marks to the very last. For our palette today, I'll be using three dots of titanium white, two dots of lead white, raw umber, burnt umber, alizarin crimson, cadmium red light, cadmium orange, yellow ochre, cadmium yellow, sap green, ultramarine blue, and ivory black. To the left of my cup here, I will be using just a regular odorless paint thinner, and to the right will be a one-fifth stand oil to four-fifths paint thinner mixture, and that will be my medium. Alright, to get started, I like to use a bristle brush. I dip it into a little bit of my medium, dab it dry, and then get into my raw umber, and the raw umber will be my drawing color. I don't want it to be too thin, and I don't want it to be straight up paint. I want a nice medium consistency from which I can draw. To start off with, I like to mark top and bottom just to get an idea of the placement of the head and the surface of which I'm painting on. I don't always stick with these two marks. Sometimes I'll I'll deviate and move the head up or down. But in this case, I'll be sticking with these two marks and really quickly just roughed in a basic shape for the head and starting to make some straight lines and angles indicating where the hair mass is going to be. So I really want to get an idea for the entire picture from the very first brush mark so that I can get an idea of my overall design. And what I mean by the overall design is that I just want to get an idea of where the hair is going to be placed in space relative to the head and where the shoulders are going to be placed. That's all that I'm thinking of when I mention the word design. I just want to know how all of the shapes will fit onto the surface. I don't know exactly yet how my precise shapes are going to be. I'm not trying to draw a specific outline for the outside of the face or even a specific angle yet for the jaw or the neck. I just want to have some place markers from which I can get an idea of where the picture is going to fit onto the surface and then build more elaborate shapes on top of these. But this is my starting point. I'm really trying to keep at arm's length at least away from my surface as I work. And I tend to hold the brush from the end, especially when I'm starting, because I want to be loose and I want to make large straight lines and angles in a very minimalistic and simplistic way so that I can capture the wholeness of the portrait and just a few basic lines. I want to be loose and I want to be organic, but at the same time, I really want some specificity. And in the beginning, I have a very basic outside shape, but then once I start to indicate the center line, that's where a little bit of specificity needs to take hold here. So the center line I've found is the most vital piece of information in the beginning, even more vital than the angle of the axis of the eyes and the nose and the mouth, although everything is important to a painting. But having the beginning be something that's simple, easy, and organic, and something that you can build from is key towards approaching portrait painting from a very understandable, or at least understandable to me, standpoint. But I just find that the center line I really want to know is the head straight on, is it three quarter, or is it profile? Remember, the center line is just that line in the middle of the face that you can see at this point here. It's telling me exactly how much space I have from the left to the right. All right, grabbing another bristle brush, a clean bristle brush that's a little bit more beat up, so this brush is a little bit more rough. I'm gonna dab it into some paint thinner and dab it dry, almost completely dry. That's the key word here, almost completely dry. So this brush is going to be my eraser brush. So I use an eraser brush, kind of like you would 
a kneaded eraser with charcoal or any kind of eraser to a pencil. I'm just using it to push the paint around just as you would with an eraser to encourage the specificity of the shapes that I will be building here. I don't always get so elaborate with my initial lines as you've noticed with other portrait painting demonstrations that I've done. I tend to jump into color very very quickly but in this case I really wanted to draw a little bit more and I wanted to draw a little more specificity early on but I want to keep the shapes very very simple. I want it simple to understand I just want to mark for the features and I want a simple shape for the outside but I want them to be as correct as I can get them. In the beginning, there can be a lot of tension, especially when you're making a portrait painting of someone you know. You really, or at least I really, really want to get their likeness fairly quickly, and I want, I don't want to insult the person that I'm painting or I'm drawing. But as it turns out, that's not a very good idea or methodology to have in mind. It's important to keep things simple and understandable for you. A brush mark may be a great indication of where a feature is going to go. Just a simple line as you've seen me indicate for the eyes, the two eyes and the nose. I'm really trying to play this game where how minimal can I make something but how accurate can I make it. And it's not the end of the world if I get the eyes a little too far up or a little far down. As long as I stand back and keep a steady distance from my painting as I work, I will see these mistakes. But it's important, at least to me, to keep in mind that I'm not trying to get a perfect likeness or I'm not trying to make it look extremely pretty in the first brush marks. In fact, I don't even think about that at all. I try to play this game with myself where I'm thinking of shapes. I'm looking at just simple shapes. Shapes meaning the outside lines encompassing the whole head and the outside lines used to indicate structures such as the eyes and the nose. But being honest to yourself and telling yourself, I'm starting this painting. This is only the start. I'm going to observe shapes. What is the shape of a particular feature? I'm not worried about what that feature is. I'm not worried at all that this is even a portrait. I'm just looking at the shapes themselves. I find that at least to me, there's another psychological factor involved in portrait painting itself. We're used to seeing pictures and images of people's faces. We're used to seeing our face in the mirror every single day. And this kind of idea of how a face should look is instilled in us very early on. And it makes it very, very hard to break from that idea of a face must look like this all the time. It's really about breaking it down into a series of shapes. A series of shapes in which you can accurately place more specific shapes on top of that really helps simplify this process down. But try to hold back from making all these details and making all these eyelashes and things that we're used to seeing in photography and in day-to-day -day life looking at mirrors and everything like that. Let's abstract what it is that we're seeing into an understandable set of basic shapes that can build into more elaborate shapes, thus resulting in that image that you see every single day in photography and in the mirror. Let's build up to that. Now I'm not saying let's create a photograph by any means. A painting, at least in my opinion, should be an organic understanding of nature. 
Your interpretation of nature is distilled into the painting. Not the photograph, not the exact person, but being true to yourself, true to your own calligraphy. Each person has their own calligraphy. Each person has their own brush mark. Each person has their own way of interpreting something in the visual realm. And that creates a great variety of elegance and beauty from people's work and how it differentiates from one person to the next. That's what creates that variety and elegance in painting. Now with this painting I'm developing more of a linear drawing and block in block in meaning i'm blocking in the entire structure with a few basic lines that's what i mean by block in so i'm building up the block in and making it a lot more elaborate than my previous demonstrations and i've made some videos where i did work in this way as well this shouldn't be too new but I'm doing this because I want to have a workable shape. This is going to provide a function for me. Once I have these shapes accurate enough to, let's say, about the accuracy of the thickness of my brush, meaning an eye should be in the right place to the extent of which it might deviate by the thickness of the side of my size 4 filbert brush. That kind of accuracy, hopefully it's not too vague, that kind of accuracy is what I want in order to move into color and move into value. Now in this painting I'm going to do my best to develop the portrait as a set of shapes of value and color. I will be developing the planes, I will be developing the structure using planes and I'll explain more about that as I go. But this drawing is going to be serving a function for me. I want it to be accurate but I don't want to be overly laborious in which this drawing will be completely perfect, nothing's wrong with it super precise because at least to me now this is only something that happens to me if I develop my drawing in this raw umber so precise and so accurate I just don't I don't leave myself any room to work with I want it to be something that I can build on top of and it's not a bad thing at all to draw it to the most perfect degree have your drawing as perfectly accurate as possible in fact i would encourage you to do that this is only for me my personal preference i don't like to completely nail the drawing but i want it to be in a workable stage of which i can build more color now if this was a pose that i would be continuing for multiple weeks yeah i would definitely build the color for certain I would sorry I would certainly build up the shape and the linear drawing now that is the difference between a one sitting painting and a painting that I will be working on for multiple sittings a painting that I will be working on for multiple sittings I will certainly spend all my time perfecting these lines that's the difference but not to fret, the result, at least for me, tends to be very similar. It's just that when I work on a painting for multiple sittings, there tends to be a higher level of refinement. But that refinement is shown even in my one sitting Ella Prima paintings in a more simplistic and minimalistic way. I try to distill the entirety of painting into basically shape value and color that's my methodology that if i get the shape right then i can place the value where it needs to be and if i get the value right then i have 
room of which I can adjust the color. So that's really the, the fundamentals in my opinion. The shape determines where I can place the value and the value determines where I can adjust the color. To further elaborate on this, I'm right now developing the shape. I'm spending a lot of time making minor adjustments now. I'm moving the eyes up a little bit, I may move the nose down, and I may move the mouth up, but I have a very defined center line, at least in my head. I have a very defined idea of how the head is turned. Remember I said the center line is that defining factor in the beginning, at least to me. I did move the eyes up a little bit on the axis. Very very minimal change. I used my drawing brush to push them a little bit higher up on the eye socket. Let's get into the shape. The shape is something that can be encompassed in just a few lines therefore the shape is a very easy concept in which you can abstract the entirety of the portrait you can capture the whole portrait in just a few lines that's the beauty and that's the elegance of the shape now when we work into value value simply is just how light or how dark is a particular area on the surface. Now value to me is the fastest and most efficient way to express form. That is because if you think about it, if that were not true then black and white photography wouldn't exist and charcoal drawings and pencil drawings would not hold an image. Now the power of the value and shape in capturing a portrait cannot be overstated, at least in my opinion. It's really, really the value that does all the work and then in the end result you notice the very harmonious color shifts and color relationships. The color is something that can be built on top of the idea and the concept of the value. And I'll further elaborate on what I mean by that later on. Just double checking my center line at the moment and I'm using that center line to place the middle of the, the mouth. So with the mouth I look for the middle and I look for the two furthest extremities left to right. And then I look at the angle at which the mouth makes. The angle is somewhat similar to the axis of the eyes, if not tilted up just a little bit more to the right. And remember, I want the accuracy to be that of the thickness of the side of my size 4 filbert brush. I want it to be very accurate, but I want to leave myself some room to work from. And let's talk a little bit more about light and dark. So I'm creating very simple shapes of light and shadow. That's all that I want at this stage of the block in. And in drawing, a drawing is a very, very useful tool to the painting. The drawing, comparing straight lines, comparing vertical lines as I'm doing, and horizontal lines from one feature to the other is a very, very useful tool. I have that the corner of the mouth lines up with the nose almost, but the corner of the mouth is still a little further left relative to that vertical line. Now the drawing serves a very very specific purpose to painting because if you can get your light and shadow shapes in check and in a workable degree of accuracy, you can build your more elaborate values on top of the simple shapes of light and shadow. If anything, all I have is an indication of the cheekbone, the little mark that I have to the left, and that's it. I don't really have any other values on the face other than light and shadow. And I've, I've said this a lot before in my previous videos, but in this one I'm definitely trying to illustrate it 
even more precisely. That if you can capture the light and shadow, spend all your time with the light and shadow, nice things can start to happen from that. Just the simple shapes of light and shadow. Let's talk about proportion. So proportion, in a sense, is a relation from one thing to the other, at least to me. Proportion means where is a certain object placed relative to another. Now you can think of proportion with a portrait as a set of lines, simple set of lines. Let's imagine a line from the axis of the eyes to the bottom of the nose. Picture that line in your head. Now picture a line from the bottom of the nose to the chin. That's another line. These two lines are lines that we can compare to one another. One may be bigger than the other in such a way that we can relate them to each other. And let's do this using our eye first. Let's bounce our eyes back and forth from the painting to the model. Bouncing our eyes back and forth from the painting to the model really helps us see the changes that need to be made. It really helps us see proportion. To me, it's always such an astounding thing that to notice when I stand further back and bounce my eyes back and forth how simple the changes can be, and that's not always the case. Sometimes the changes can be more difficult. But at least in this simple shape idea, the change is often a brush mark to push an eye up or push a nose down relative to each other. All right, switching over to a different brush, a new brush, or at least a clean brush. I'm dabbing it into my medium and then dabbing it dry on the paper towel. So I'm going to be mixing up a combination of burnt umber, sap green, and a little bit of ivory black to give me a dark value. I don't want it to be straight black, but a fairly dark value. And I'm going to use this to start to place some dark accents in the hair. Um, so now we're going to be getting into value. Now the transition from shape to value can be a very very simple transition because if you have the shape down as accurately placed as you can put it then it can necessitate the values now you can see that i'm breaking down the hair into a set of dark shapes and these dark shapes are planes a plane is a simplified three-dimensional concept of a flat surface in space what that means is that the plane change can be indicated by the value change. Just the value change indicates the plane change by itself. This is why I said that value alone can give you the fullness of a form in a very, very simplified and easy to understand way. So I'm breaking down the curls of the hair into just a set of light and dark shapes and I'm using the application of paint to also help me get the idea of the individual strands of hair. I'm letting the brush marks do that for me and I'm just using that to very very roughly and simply sketch in the hair. All right, now we're going to get into some cadmium orange, yellow ochre, burnt umber, and some raw umber, and lizard crimson, ultramarine blue, and back to the yellow ochre. And we're going to be mixing up a value. Now remember, I'm thinking of value primarily, but I'm also creating a color that's on the warmer side. Now this color and value is going to be the cast shadow underneath of the model's jaw. 
Now the photo reference was taken under natural light. So there was a north light window providing the light source. And the theories of cool light, warm shadow, warm light, cool shadow really just mean that the shadow is a little bit warmer than the the flesh colors. And that's often the case even in warm light settings. It all depends on the environment. But for this value, I just wanted it to be dark, but not as dark as the dark accents of the hair and a little bit warm. Now for this painting, uh, since I was able to take the photograph in natural light, there was a lot of nice and beautiful, elegant colors. So throughout the rest of this demonstration, you're going to be seeing a lot more of my palette. So my palette's really going to be a star here. You're going to see these mixtures develop one after the other in a way a little bit more elaborate than my previous videos. I'm definitely going to try to impose on you the color changes and the color relations relative to one another. But to get started, I still think about value primarily. Now, the transition from shape to value can happen in a simple way if you take the time to really stand back and squint at your model. Uh, but let me guide you through in a more structural understanding. So I placed a dark light on the side of the face and that dark light is a value that's being emanated from the fact that the model's cheekbone is turning away from the light that creates that dark light. And the same thing goes with the side of the forehead. And these values are demonstrated through the understanding of the structure. Now getting back into the, the color here, I'm going to be working my way up the value scale. As you can tell, I'm going to be showing you more and more footage in this painting of the mixing because the colors are a lot more elaborate and a lot more varied in this photo reference just because I was able to photograph the model in natural light under a north light. So we're going up in the value scale. Remember I'm thinking primarily of value. We're going up in the value scale that is we're going a little bit lighter and now I'm starting to indicate a different plane. The plane for the side of the nose is a little bit lighter than the side planes closest to the cast shadow. But they're still relatively dark relative to the other planes. So that's why I'm building my way up on the value scale. From a structural standpoint, we have the zygomatic bone, the cheekbone, across the side of the face uh, with its darker value. And we have the side plane of the nose, as you've seen me indicate. Now we're rolling around the bottom of the jaw, creating another value change. Still with the same brush, it's just that I'm applying less and less paint to get that gradation. And then the side of the eye, the eye socket, we have that deep, dark value. Working my way up on the value scale, I'm introducing more and more lizard and crimson, uh, lead white, and raw umber. That mixture I found with this painting is helping me get a nice warm middle ground of which I can build more colors on top of. I also put in a little bit of sap green into the mix to cool it down. So as I go and progress into the face, I'm working my way up the value scale. But I'm also providing a warmer and darker ground. And that is so that I can build more elaborate colors on top of. Because as I develop the painting, I introduce more and more white into the mixtures, inevitably. That's why I have much more white on my palette, because I tend to use more of it into the mixtures. And I'm painting relatively thin. I'm kind of scumbling on the paint now at this point. So I'm introducing a darker, warmer value. 
of which we will build more elaborate shapes and planes on top of. All right, using the same brush, moving our way up the value scale, I'm going back into the lead white, the cadmium yellow, and to the cadmium red, back to the cadmium yellow. All right, so the lead white, uh, I should elaborate on why I use lead white and titanium white. Now, before I was using a flake white replacement, and that was because I wanted a more transparent white. And it, it was working pretty well. I just wanted to try out a different color. Remember, I don't always like to do the same thing at the same time, every single time. I like to change things up. So this lead white is actually a zinc white. It's a transparent white. So what it does, its property is that it's a very, very thin white. So I can cool down the value. I can brighten the value. I can make it lighter and still maintain the depth of that color mixture more than I can with the titanium white. So the difference is, the titanium white tends to work very, very well at bringing the value up, but it also blasts the color a tad bit. Now the lead white, or the, the zinc white that I'm using, the zinc white does contain lead, so I'm calling it lead white, the zinc white also is a very, very thin white, and for that reason a lot of people don't like it. But I thought I'd experiment with it. The zinc white really is a very, very thin white that I'm learning to use in a very cautious manner because it helps me build the value a little bit higher up, not as high as titanium white, but it helps me maintain the depth of that color. It helps me maintain the richness of that color. Let's talk a little bit as to why I have a tones background, a neutral gray background. Now I toned it with a neutral gray acrylic paint and this is because I want a value essentially that can make my darks look dark and my lights look light. That's pretty much why I have a neutral background. Um, but the gray also actually helps me with the color. It helps me go higher up in color and higher or lower in color. It helps me key the color either to a more saturated extent or, or a less saturated extent. It helps me go warmer and it helps me go cooler because it's neutral. It's a neutral color. Back to the palette, we are getting into some sap green. Burnt Umber, back to the sap green, cadmium yellow, yellow ochre. Uh, notice I'm using my dark brush, so I'm mixing a dark value. Now, I like to keep a light brush and a dark brush. Sometimes I use different brushes for different areas, such that I painted a man with a beard before and I kept a separate brush for the beard and a separate brush for the flesh colors and a separate brush for the background. That type of variation helps me out here. Uh, but for this demonstration, I'm going to be very, very keenly focused on the portrait. So with the dark brush, I'm going back into the side plane of the face. Remember the cheekbone, the zygomatic bone, and now the side of the eye socket. Now uh, the eye socket that's most facing us has a deep, dark, a rich value turning. But also that value is a little bit of a greenish color. Now remember, I think value first, but the color is also a little bit more greenish. A little bit blue and somewhat more greenish. Now I'm trying to relate the overall color a little bit more than I'm thinking about the temperature. Uh, what I mean here is that I'm relating that color shape. Okay, so the shape of the side of the cheekbone and the side of the eye socket uh, relating that color to the surrounding flesh tone color now i know that that color was a beginning color so i can build on but i also know that the colors that i will be building on future passes will be warmer in relation to that color and they will be even more pink 
relative to the side plane of the face. So as a relation, the side of the face, the darker values, are a little bit more greenish than the pinker flesh tones in the middle. I'm not going to make straight pink or straight green here. That's why I introduced a lot of other colors into the mixture. That's why I go between complementary colors quite a bit so that I can get a nice variety. I'm also, with this demonstration, going to try to keep my planes well established. So I'm not really going to be softening too many edges until the very, very last clip of this video. Uh, so I really, really wanted to push forward that idea of establishing my planes in space my large planes of value and color without softening anything too much because it's always easier to soften an edge of a shape than it is to create that shape itself. I also like to keep the value scale on my palette well ordered um, and sometimes to change the color just a tad bit to the warmer side I'll add very rapidly a combination of all my warms and then my warms meaning my red, my orange, and my yellows and then I neutralize it a tad bit with my burnt umber and then lighten it with the lead white. I do this mixture quite rapidly but then I vary the color at the end. Do I want it to be a little bit more pinkish? In this case, I wanted it to be a little more pinkish. So this value is a neutral in value, but the color itself is warm. It's on the pinkish side, but it's not straight pink. Uh, that is, I introduced some of my burnt umber and lead white into the mixture to neutralize the saturation of that pink color. Carrying forward that idea of breaking it down into easy and simple abstract shapes holds from the very beginning of the painting to the very very end and especially in the middle stages we really want to simplify things down. Back to the value scale. I'm dabbing into my yellows now with the lead white. Remember I'm using the lead white because it's a very transparent white. We're going up in value but we're going a little bit more yellow in color. Now take caution when I say yellow I'm not trying to make the cheek straight up cadmium yellow. Instead I'm taking advantage of the fact that I have more neutral colors already established on the palette to help me neutralize this color. And to neutralize, there are two ways to do it. You can put a gray into your yellow, or you can put a complementary color. But in this case, I went with the grays that were already on the color. I'm trying to vary the colors into relation to one another, but I'm also trying not to overly saturate the colors either. Remember, saturation would be straight up yellow, straight bright yellow, or straight bright red. I don't want that in the portrait. I want a nice middle ground of which I can work and create more elaborate colors. Now the challenge in Alla Prima is to get shape, value, and color working as accurately as possible. But I am definitely, 
definitely trying to simplify it down in the sense that I spent a lot of time figuring out the shape on the palette I'm ordering the values so that I keep my values in check and I'm keeping a consideration for the structure of the face to guide my values and then ultimately with the color I'm thinking of it very very minimalistically and at a very very refined simple manner I'm gauging the colors in relation to each other as more yellow more pink or more green and I'm trying to relate the overall shape of that value first before I change the color in any way because remember you can always change the color a little bit but it's much more difficult to figure out what that value is supposed to be. Now remember that each value change is a plain change. You saw me earlier put that more yellowish value on the, the cheekbone and that is a very predominant plain change. The forehead, that value I just placed was a very predominant plain change and now I'm applying it onto the nose with the same brush. So I'm definitely trying to simplify things down by unifying the colors a little bit. Um, just as you would with an ink drawing, depending on how hard you press on the brush, you will get a bolder line, a thicker line. And the application of paint on the painting is something that I'm also taking into consideration. I'm applying more paint in some areas by pressing down harder on the brush and I'm applying less paint in some areas by applying less pressure onto the brush. In that sense I'm creating a simple, easy and manageable way of applying the paint so that in areas of higher concentration of color I can apply even more and more paint like the area of the forehead. Now the colors on the flesh can be rather deceiving. There's this idea of mud and how people say, oh, avoid making bad color choices, bad color combinations. No, that in my opinion, there's no such thing as mud. If you think about it, oil paint is colored mud, but it's beautiful in the sense that relating the colors relative to one another on that underlying structure of the value can give you such an elegance and color. There's no such thing as an ugly color. It's just a color that wasn't related well to the surrounding colors. That's how I perceive the idea of making flesh tone mixtures. There's no such thing as an ugly color. There's only a color that's not well related to the other colors. But now how do we relate the colors to one another? As I said earlier, the side of the face is more greenish, the cheek is more pinkish, and then the top plane of the cheek as I'm painting now is a little bit more on the yellowish side. Now, I'm thinking of the color in relation to the other color because if I think of it solely on the purpose of temperature, you can have a warm color that's still on the greenish side, but green is a cool color. So you can see how that wouldn't really work. But as far as temperature is concerned, I am thinking about relative temperature in areas such as the nose, the cheek, and I will be considering that with the lips a little bit. The temperature is how hot or how cool a color is and that's a great way to simplify the areas of color. But with the individual shapes of color, I'm relating them based on the hue. Is it greenish, pinkish, yellowish, grayish? I'm thinking in those terms. Now with the same colors that were already on the flesh tone mixtures on my brush, I'm going to get back into the titanium white, the ultramarine blue, and the sap green. Now I'm making this cooler 
color combination and attempts to create a lighter shape on the face that is cooler in temperature but in terms of color is also a little bit more on the blue side now remember there was already some paint on my brush so i took that paint into account in that mixture now this value is light but it's not straight white and it's a plane that's more facing the light than the other planes so that's why it is getting lighter now remember value is the easiest way to describe and illustrate form and I had that idea in my head this is what goes on in my head my thought process at this point is I know that this value is lighter I know that this value isn't straight white and I know where this value needs to go now let me think about the temperature let me think about the color now that I have that value worked out that color was a little bit more blue than the surrounding colors and it was a little bit more green and it was a little bit cooler relative to the other colors now remember when i say that it's more blue or it's more greenish it's not straight up blue or green and in fact you may not even see any of the blue or the green that i'm talking about but it's a very, very subtle variation in color. You saw me apply those colors onto the brush, therefore you know that those colors are in that mixture. But they're very, very subtle. They're not bright. They're not overly saturated. They're subtle. And I want them to harmonize with the surrounding colors. Very, very subtle. And as I move around the face, whether I want something to be pinker or more blue, I I dab that onto the brush. Just a little bit of cadmium red is what gave me this little shape that I'm applying at the moment. In the middle value of my scale here, I have my alizarin, yellow ochre, cadmium yellow, sap green, and ultramarine blue. And then I lightened it up with a little bit of the lead white so that I would maintain the richness of this color. But here we are middle value on my value scale you've seen the colors that i mixed up and they were a little bit more on the brown goldish scale now color is very very subjective and one color may be seen or perceived by one person a tad bit different from another person you can have arguments all day long about was his shirt gray or was it blue Ultimately, it's the value that you saw first. Ultimately, it was the value that made that distinction between shirt or surrounding background. Now, what I'm trying to say is that the value of the side plane of the nose is very much in the middle of my value scale, but the color, I perceived it to be a little bit more on the golden brown and greenish side I tend to err on the side of neutral golden gray color as opposed to the brown I'm thinking of the side plane of the nose is more on the yellow ochre side still in this darker middle value scale I'm now going to adjust the color to a little bit more on the pinkish side and I'm going to achieve that by mixing on top of that golden ochre color that I had with a cadmium red and the lead white so that I can maintain the depth of that color. And that value is a mid value and I'm placing it right next to the top plane of the cheek as we approach closer and closer to the zygomatic bone, the cheekbone. And I'm trying to maintain the structural integrity of this shape. So I'm not trying to blend it at all. I'm just trying to put this value in its correct place and relate the color relative to the other colors it was a little bit more on the pinkish side but i introduced some of the golden ochres from the nose into that mixture as well using that same color i'm also applying it to the side of the the eye the inner tear duct and in the eye socket um, 
you see me applying that right now and I'm actually mixing on the surface as I apply this paint I know that the paint the layer of paint underneath is still wet so I can still mix colors right on top of other colors so here we go with a mixture of burnt umber alizarin crimson and cadmium red light I'm creating a darker red background but I'm neutralizing the saturation of that red with my burnt umber now this mixture is going to be applied to the background now I actually like to have a color next to another color so that I can properly gauge those colors relative to each other and I pretty much like to do this when I'm thinking about the color so I just applied that color that warmer red color for the background and now I'm going to use that to relate the surrounding colors on the flesh all right back to the palette on the lighter end of the value scale I'm introducing some more of the cadmium yellow the lead white and mixing it with some of my cadmium orange just a little bit to get a warmer color dabbing it into my medium then dabbing the medium a little bit dry so that I can get a nice consistency of paint I don't want it to be too thin and I don't want it to be too thick either and back into the alizarin crimson I've mixed up a lighter color that's still on the yellow side but not straight up yellow either and I've neutralized it a little bit with the colors that were already on the brush and the colors that were already on the surface of the painting and I'm using these colors as I build up higher and higher in value you notice that I'm introducing more and more white as I mentioned that I would as I progress I work lighter and lighter that's why my initial ground was a little bit darker in value and a little bit warmer to facilitate these mixtures that are now being applied onto the surface as I develop the painting Now I've switched from a size 4 filbert, now I'm working with a size 2 little filbert and I dabbed it into my medium first, dabbed it dry and now I'm going into my sap green, yellow ochre and cadmium orange and I'm going to use a little bit of the, uh, the lead white as well to maintain the integrity of that color and I'm going to neutralize it a little bit with the raw umber and burnt umber and I'm mixing up this color so that I can put yet another light value on top of that plane that you saw me paint that was a little bit more on the bluish side now that big shape was more on the bluish side and this smaller shape is now still on that bluish side but neutralized even more so it's further on the gray side now so I had that large shape of lighter value cooler color more on the blue and I'm adding onto that color now trying to make the value a little bit higher because as we get closer and closer to the tear duct that plane is facing the light even more than before but I'm also maintaining the integrity of that large shape of color as well as I progress on the painting and add more and more planes, more and more value changes, I tend to rapid fire on the palette um, back and forth with the same brush. I maintain the colors, the previous color mixtures on my value scale as you've seen me do. But what I mean by rapid fire is I very quickly pick up different colors and values from my value scale on the palette and apply them to the painting therefore I'm minimizing actual mixing time but I'm also maintaining the overall color and value structure on the painting I keep different areas on the palette for uh, colors that are going to be way different from the flesh tone mixtures and in this case the pupil uh, the models pupil I couldn't quite tell from the photo reference I think 
and it's a, a gray green blue uh, that's why you see me mixing my ultramarine blue ivory black yellow ochre and sap green into this mixture uh, I don't know exactly what the color of the pupil is but it is a lot cooler than the surrounding colors and in value it is lighter in value than the raw umbra that had, that had previously placed but i'm also using the fact that i have that raw umber on the the surface to help me neutralize that blue as well remember in the beginning i told you we would be building simple basic easy shapes of which we can build more elaborate shapes on top of well that's what we're doing now we're building smaller and smaller shapes don't be afraid to move forward in your paintings you don't always have to keep it just a parallelogram for the eye socket or a rectangle for the nose it's okay to progress even further and further as a my teacher that i once had before told me stumble forward in error just find your way as you go it's just paint. If you make any kind of mistakes, it's quite simple to adjust them with a few brush marks if you keep the development of the painting simple. Uh, now we're building the values of the eye, also keeping in consideration the overall placement. I haven't actually moved the placement of the eyes. I'm actually pretty satisfied with the placement of the eyes. So now I'm building even more and more values on top of it. Now with the little tiny brush I'm creating a mixture of burnt umber and cadmium orange, just burnt umber and cadmium orange to give me a darker yet warmer on the orange side color that I'm going to use to place on the inside corner of the eye right below the upper eyelid. Um, it's a little bit of reflection from the warmth of the the flesh tones and just a little bit of color just a little accent can make all the difference in the sense that it creates that illusion of the form on the surface now with that tiny brush i'm going back into the color that i already had that lighter blue green color and i'm also mixing it with the flesh tone colors that were already on the palette to create a light a gray color that will be suitable for the white of the eye known as the sclera as i've mentioned before remember the white of the eye is not white it's not straight of white in value and the color itself is, is relatively gray it's more on the gray side relative to the other color surrounding certainly not pink but more on the gray side with that same brush, I just dipped it into the middle values that I already had, the warmer middle values. And I'm going to use it to paint that value in for the top plane of the lower eyelid. And that's a small little touch. All it takes is a small little touch to get the illusion of the eye on top of the lower eye socket. I mean, the lower eyelid. Just a little touch to get that light just beneath of the pupil. Back to the color of the sclera, I'm just trying to more finely shape this pupil in the eye, in the eye, in the eye socket. Now remember I said I'd be building more specific shapes on top of those basic shapes. So here we are now building yet even more specific shapes but in the same manner of which we're building smaller shapes on top of larger shapes we're building more elaborate shapes on top of more simple shapes and it's just with a few brush marks to create that illusion of form that illusion of the light turning across the side of the eye the side of the iris and the pupil used just a little bit of ivory black i used just a little bit of ivory black with my raw umber so i wouldn't have a straight up black 
for that dark value that I just painted. Now remember we don't want to use straight black on any of the dark areas of the eyes. Think about it, straight black would be like the absolute darkest thing you can have. And that tends to jump out and that's not really something we want. We don't want anything to be immediately jumping out. Now for the highlights of the eyes, the highlights definitely going to be the brightest area. And I'm going to use the titanium white to bring that value up right away. And with a little bit of the ultramarine blue, just a tad bit of ultramarine blue, I have a nice natural light looking highlight that I can place on the iris. Now with the nice middle ground that I had already mixed up from the palette, I flattened out this plane a little bit more above the eyes so that I can introduce more crisp and clear value changes. Getting back into the palette with a little bit of burnt umber on the brush that I already had and some raw umber, I'm going to be mixing up right on top of the colors that I already had adding a little bit more sap green into the mixture and with this color I'm going to create a definitive plane change so remember the plane change is indicated by the value change and I'm introducing this plane now curving across the inside of the eye socket into the eye and with this plane I'm going to then build another plane on top of it to create even smaller structures. Remember working big shapes to little shapes. Now we're getting into the smaller shapes. The smallest shapes we can get to with this kind of brush. Now as we work into smaller shapes of color, I try to maintain the integrity of the large color shape that of which it rests on top of. So the smaller color changes, the smaller form change and color changes that I make are going to be of the same family of the larger color shape that I previously had. As you saw me mix earlier on the palette, I have a lighter, cooler color to fit in with the lighter plane underneath of the eye. Remember that lighter, cooler value that I had mixed up with the, the lead white and the ultramarine blue and the sap green. And with a little bit of variation of the touch, I'm pushing this color into the darker color that I had mixed in the previous clip. And that's helping me create this gradation of value using the paint layer that was underneath to create that illusion of value change, subtle value change across the surface of the eye. Back to my size 4 filbert with the flesh color still on the brush, I'm going into the cadmium orange, the cadmium yellow, and the lead white, and I'm mixing on top of the colors that were already there on the lighter area of the value scale of my palette using more and more paint now I'm going to be adding yet another plane change onto the top plane of the cheek remember I painted it a little bit lighter and more on the yellow side and now I'm introducing still that same family of color but 
lighter in value as I create yet another plane that's going to be facing closer and closer to the light. Remember I'm painting with large planes of color and that brush that I had before mixing the value on the top of the eye, I used that same exact brush to adjust the value underneath of the bottom eyelid. So now I'm relating these larger shapes of color to one another, creating more and more color relationships relative to one another. Remember the relation is just that the top plane of the cheek was a little bit more yellow and of course lighter in value so I created yet another plane on top of it that was in that same yellow family but with a tad bit more of the cadmium orange and with that brush that I had used to paint the lighter areas above the eye I adjusted the value of the the value to the left corner of the eye and then added actually a little bit more of the raw umber into the mix to make it less of a green and now with that same brush with the raw umber I added a little bit more of the lead white to create a nice neutral green pass from the top plane of the cheek as I roll across the face towards the eye socket structure so I'm creating another variation of green remember that the side of the face was a little bit more greenish and now I added another variation of value in that same relation of greenish tone. I'm using a soft dry sable brush just to soften up some of the edges. I'm not trying to get too crazy with softening up all of the edges and I will soften up some of the edges also near the end. So as, my, as I work my way uh, with this painting I'm gonna start rapid firing with the palette meaning I'll go back and forth on the palette and adjust the colors quite rapidly because I had left many of the color mixtures on my palette with the value scale and I keep these colors on my palette so that I can go back and forth the nose is being painted with the same mixture uh, the light of the nose is being painted with the same color mixture that was used for the highlight uh, right above the the eye the lighter planes of the eye that cooler lighter mixture and I'm rapid firing between these colors because I know that it helps me maintain that simplicity uh, maintaining the mixtures that I had for the large shapes of colors and using them and adjusting them just a tad bit to create smaller and smaller planes as I go Remember each plane change is pretty much a spatial relation based on where that one particular object is in space relative to the light source. Now the areas that I'm painting that are lighter are facing the light most. That means if you picture the light beam traveling onto the model's face. Now I know light isn't going to be a straight beam, light is diffuse, but I'm simplifying it to an area of the face that's most facing that light source. It will be lighter and as I roll across from that light source it gets darker and areas can roll away from the light, push back into the light, and then roll back away from the light, creating that variety of values. And as I adjust the colors I'm trying to maintain the integrity of the big colors that I had, but I'm adjusting them with little little increments of cadmium red here and there, some sap green here and there to cool it down. But I'm maintaining the overall integrity of these values and these colors as I progress along the painting. With my little tiny brush, I'm going to be dipping it into the burnt umber, some sap green, and raw umber, and a tad bit of the ivory black. And this is going to create a nice dark value for me. Not straight black, remember I'm trying to avoid using straight black in any of the dark accents. Uh, but I'm going to use this dark value to paint the nostril. 
Now as we work into the shapes of the nose now, I'm going to explain a little bit more how I developed the planes and the structure of the nose. Um, so with the nose, I tend to push shapes a little bit further than need be. I push them a little bit bigger because I carve into those shapes to create smaller and smaller shapes. Immediately after painting that dark accent of the nostril, I'll go one up in value, meaning going one up higher on the value scale with a darker green mixture. Remember the side planes of the face I labeled as a little bit more on the greenish side. So I'm putting this value right on top of the dark accent that I had painted for the nose. And with this value, I'm going to create a gradation of value as you turn into the nostril but I'm also kind I'm also trying to differentiate that plane I'm also trying to overstate that it's darker because I want to have that plane change clearly defined and then as I build on top of that plane I will start to lighten it up similar to the way that I used a darker and warmer color on the flesh before building up the lighter and cooler values. Now going up in value again, I'm going to use some of the, the warms, so the cadmium orange, burnt umber, cadmium red, and I'm trying to build a color that is and now a much warmer and remember I said I was going to relate the colors of the flesh to the background this would be a nice color to relate to the background color the background color is much more red in comparison to this warmer accent to the bottom of the wing of the nose having those two colors to relate to relative to one another it helps me out a lot engaging what this color is in relation to the other colors. Essentially the value is dark. It is in the shadow closer and closer to the nostril uh, but it is warm in terms of temperature and now in color it is more of an orange like color versus the background color. So I like comparing reds to one another, blues relative to one another. I like comparing all different types of hues relative to one another to get more of an understanding of what that color is. Now we're gonna go one up in value again and I'm gonna be using the colors that were already on my palette and adjusting them just with a little bit of cadmium orange. And now I'm gonna use this to build yet another plane as we roll across to the top of the nostril. So we're rolling across the side of the nose, so the wing of the nose. Now we're moving more towards the top regions of the nose. And I'm still breaking it down into simple and easy to understand plane changes. I'm making these plane changes now as crisp and clear as possible. And as you noticed, I cut right into that darker value that I had. I used that darker value above the nostril because I knew that I would come right back into it with another color such as the one that I just used. And this is how I, I move around. Sometimes I may push something too light or too dark and then I adjust the values as I go from there. And with the same brush, applying just a little bit more of the flesh mixture right from my palette. Remember rapid fire, I just went right back to the color that was already on my palette. Now I'm building up yet another top plane to the nose. I'm subdividing even more planes on top of the nose as I go. Rapid firing between the colors on my palette really really helps me create smaller shapes in a much faster way because I don't have to completely mix everything as I go. Nothing has to be a novel discovery from this point on. It's really about just creating smaller and smaller value changes that still hold in that large value and color family. Remember I had the nose a little bit warmer and I used more of my oranges. So the whole plane, the whole 
shape of the nose in a sense is a little bit more on the orange side relative to say the pink of the cheek and the yellow of the top plane of the cheek so I am keeping a relation with the large color families and as I break them down I rapid fire with the palette by building more and more value changes that are within that value family so now with the palette again I'm building up a different color one that you have not seen me use before on the flesh a little bit of ultramarine blue and alizarin crimson gives me a nice muted violet color with the addition of a little bit of the flesh color I can neutralize this color so this color is going to create a sort of cool sparkle if you will above the upper lid of the mouth so above the upper lip I'm going to be placing this color now and I'm gonna make the color notation and then I'm going to relate it to the other color that's similar to this color which is the light color of the eye the top plane of the eye remember it was a little bit more bluish now this color is going to be a little bit more on the violet scale a little bit of a lizard and crimson onto that color and now I have the top plane of the bottom lip which is a little bit more of a velvety alizarin crimson mixture but still neutralizing that mixture with the colors that were already on the surface of the painting. Now with my tiny brush I'm going to be going right into the lighter region of my value scale on the palette with a little bit of my cadmium red and my titanium white to get that punch in value and still have a slightly reddish touch. And now I'm going to be putting this warmer reddish pink color on the bottom of the nose so I'm sharpening the plane underneath the bottom of the nose and I'm also raising the value of that plane of the muzzle of the mouth the muzzle being the surface encompassing the mouth and the jaw itself and I'm going to use that same color on the cheek so I'm unifying that value of the cheek as well going back to my size too Filbert I'm mixing some raw umber on top of the colors that I already had with a little bit of the lead white to create a nice a neutral very very neutral greenish tone and I'm going to use it to paint a lighter value and cooler value on top of the philtrum and the philtrum being the the area between the top of the middle of the lip and the bottom middle of the nose that's all I'm doing just adjusting that color as I go and with the same brush I just dipped it into a tad bit more of the raw umber and I'm pushing the shadow of the the nose the cast shadow of the nose just a little bit higher so I'm adjusting the shape as I go with this color I actually pushed the shadow of the nose up with a different brush so I actually switched between these two brushes to push the nose up and bring the value so now with that size 2 filbert brush I'm going back in with some of my ultramarine blue alizarin crimson now to get a little bit of a violet type touch and going back into the more pinkish lighter mixtures that I had for the flesh so creating a very very novel gray color and I'm using it now to bring even more light to the filtrum area. I'm relating that color uh, with the surrounding cooler colors. It is a little bit more on the cooler velvety scale, but it's not quite as blue as that violet underneath of the, the eye, the light 
near the eye and it's not as warm as the highlight above the lip so i'm relating those colors relative to one another but i'm also keeping track of where i am on the value scale each one of these mixtures that i create of color is still has a strong value foundation using the value scale on my palette really helps me see how these colors are going to work relative to each other in terms of lightness and darkness before I apply the paint onto the surface. Now with that same brush, I'm going to be introducing another plane underneath of the bottom lip onto the side of the lip, creating the muzzle structure, the muzzle being the area encompassing the mouth. You can think of the mouth as a large cylinder curving into itself, creating the lips, curving out of itself, creating the outside of the lips, and then curving back into the chin. So I'm relating these values relative to one another with a structural understanding as well as relating the colors to one another. Going back into the middle value region of my value scale, I'm just mixing some cadmium red with some of the cadmium yellow on top of the colors that I already had. Now given the fact that I painted a little bit darker and a little bit warmer to begin with with the flesh colors, I'm now going to go back in with this color on my brush that is going to be a little bit lighter and I'm going to unify the region of the chin directly below the ubicularis oris, the muzzle of the mouth. And I'm going to be rolling across to the side of the jaw bone. So that structure of the jaw bone is going to be receiving more and more light than the surrounding regions below the cheekbone. So that structure is, shouldn't be too difficult to paint, just applying a little bit more paint with a value that's just a little bit lighter in a color that's just a little bit warmer relative to the surrounding colors and i'm building up that shape using my dark brush onto the yellow ochre a little bit of the ultramarine blue and the alizarin crimson i'm mixing up a value that's just a little bit darker than the middle of my value scale that is just a little bit darker than the value that I had just painted. And now I'm going to go further up the mandible, further up the jawbone as we approach the bottom of the zygomatic bone, the bottom of the cheekbone. And I'm painting a value that is lighter than the previous value, but is still darker than the area connecting the bottom of the jawbone and the ubicularis oris so it is a little bit lighter than the region that was painted there before but it's a little bit darker than the area directly beneath of the mouth the area of the chin just a little bit darker than that back to the palette now we're going to be using some of the raw umber burnt umber sap green ultramarine blue, a little bit of the blue that we previously mixed, the blue-gray that we used for the eyes earlier, including that into the mixture, and a little bit more of the ultramarine blue and alizarin crimson velvety violet mixture. Um, so I'm trying to create a nice cool yet warm in temperature mixture. So a little bit of a gray and some of my oranges to create a nice neutral dark color and I'm going to go back into the cast shadow now so the cast shadow directly underneath of the draw and I'm going to further draw out the the line between the light and the shadow and I'm going to further articulate the structure of the models jawbone 
and I'm going to be pushing this shape a little bit higher up. I did have the chin a tad bit too far down and remember as I usually say it's oftentimes the smallest brush marks that we can make that can make all the difference in a portrait painting. In the beginning we want to be simple, abstract, and work in a way such that we can build from and as we progress in the middle stages we rely heavily on the simplicity that we had in order to create more and more articulate shapes in a simplified and understandable manner. So now going back into the cadmium orange and a little bit of the background mixture that I had and some of the yellow ochre on top of the flesh colors that I already had I'm going to go one up in value just a tad bit that is I'm going up in value just a tad bit adding a nice and orangey variation and that variation is going to give me a little bit of the reflected light directly underneath of the jawbone remember reflected light should never ever be confused with any of the values in the light. Therefore, reflected light, in my opinion, is a nice area to let a color change do the work for you instead of a value change. Now, I did make the value a tad bit lighter, I admit, as I was mixing on the palette, but in the back of my mind, I knew that I wanted to maintain the integrity of the value families. That is, none of the values in the light should ever be as dark as any of the values in the shadow because once we break that distinction between light and shadow things can start to get a little bit lost and a little bit murky but don't fret it's just paint simple changes can make all the difference just a simple brush mark here and there can really make a whole lot of difference with the portrait. Now as I work my way up the mandible, I'm going to actually be using that same brush to mix right on the painting a dark light. The darkest light that you can get as you approach the shadow. Using my tiny brush with a little bit of the flesh mixture that was already on it, I added a little bit of raw umber and now I'm using it to paint a value that's a little bit darker as we roll across the side of the face but not too dark. I don't want it to be an over exaggeration because it's just a color that's going to be transitioning into the outside of the face. So I push that value, I push that color a little bit further and now I'm come, going to cut back into it with the background brush. I left that brush with the background color alone. I didn't use it for anything else, I just left it there so that I, as I progress further into the painting I knew that I would use that background color brush to further articulate the side of the face the outside structure and the outside shape of the side of the face. Now as we progress further into the painting, I'm going to be painting the dark value for the hair, even more dark accents for the hair, using just burnt umber, ultramarine blue, and a tad bit of ivory black onto my dark brush. And I'm going to be further developing the shape of the hair. But remember, with the hair, even with the hair, I still maintain a structural integrity. That is, I have light and shadow, and I have different planes indicating different areas of the hair. But I'm going to leave the hair mostly sketched in. So now would be a great time to talk about the actual process that we have been carrying out throughout this painting. Let's recap about that process that I'm talking about. Remember I was saying in the beginning, I want to simplify this in terms of shape, value, and color. And edge, edge is just what lies in between the shapes. So let's reiterate. In the beginning, I spent a long time figuring out the shapes, or, or long time to me. I figured out the shapes and then I had the order of the values ranging from the darkest to the lightest. First I had my shapes of light and shadow and then I started introducing my darker values 
across the side of the face and the side of the nose. And then I started to develop the color. I remember I laid down a color that was a little bit darker and a little bit warmer so that I could build the other colors on top of. And then we went into a larger variety of planes. And those planes were indicated by value changes. And then once I figured out what those value changes were going to be, then I started comparing the colors relative to one another. I compared the colors relative to one another. The side of the face was more green, the top plane of the face was more yellow, and so on. We built more and more color relationships relative to one another. And then as we progressed into the smaller shapes, we maintained that integrity of the value and the large color relationship. We maintained that integrity as we got into the smaller shapes. So now as we progress further and further into the final stages of the painting, we find that we have subdivided the planes as much as we can with the size brushes that we're using. And now we're going to get into what I said before would be a soft synthetic brush to push the edges into one another and create a nice variety of edge. Now for this painting I'm only going to soften the edges as we roll across the side of the face into the cheekbone. I found that the rest of the edges I actually want to leave a little bit more on the sharper side. Just a soft whisper of the soft synthetic brush will do. Enough to push the edges into a more softer gradation as you roll across the side of the face. But these will be the final brush strokes that I will be applying to the painting. I'd like to thank you so much for watching this week's portrait painting demonstration. I know it was a long one, over an hour and 30 minutes worth of content, but I hope that you enjoyed this video and thank you so much for watching my portrait painting demonstration. Stay tuned for next week's video. Thank you.